So, um, so thank you for coming. And that's, this is a session, uh, basically it should have been a kind of both. So rather, it's not so for showing so ma many things, but to be more about discussions. So that, so to say, this is a free preemption session. <laughs> so, so interrupt me at any time. And so I'm Takashi, and um, originally this was uh, this session was brought by, by Sri, but uh, he unfortunately cannot attend this meeting. So, uh, so why uh, I took over uh, the role for leading the session? And this is about um, Aleph kernel package discussion. So as I said, this is kind of both, and we talk about packaging of the kernel. And uh, okay, let me start from the uh, current status of the Alp kernel. Um, we had we have had regular discussions, uh, so most monthly or biweekly, so by an Alp um, kernel working group, and um, some things have been decided. For example, um, we took over the stable branch for the tumbleweed just for the Alp. So we started from scratch from Tumbleweed instead of three. And um, thanks to the, um, the performance team, so they measured their performance on 6.2 kernel and 6.3 kernel, and we agree that 6.3 kernel is uh, somehow, somehow acceptable. So we take that 3.6 kernel as a base kernel version for the first ALP release. And then um, the requirement for ALP, well, uh, I heard that ALP is a successor <laughs> of the SD. <laughs> so um, for the natural demand, we were asked to have some kernel ABI compatibility stuff. And it might be just like a SD so far. And we took over the um, kernel pack, so package splitting uh, policy from the S3 so far. Uh, but still, uh, until now, the optional kernel, default optional uh, package is not uh, built yet. It just needs to be somehow so flipping the flag and so on. And we did some um, diet for reducing the uh, kernel package size, because ALP is also supposed to be deployed for the smaller systems, and then light weight and smaller kernel packages are preferred. So that we started dropping some obscure driver kernel config options, and some tries to drop some features, and it's still an ongoing effect, uh, ongoing effort. And so far, so good. It's we ha we, we, what we have done. We we will be doing nice. And then we have some questions. Uh, then discussions that we haven't get any agreement so far on the working group. <clears throat> and one of the things is a kernel package, a kernel package stacking and modularity. Um, Right now, we built um, so basically three kernel, um, so split package and one kernel default base. So the kernel default and the kernel default extra and kernel default optional. And these are uh, split packages. That means that we built just a kernel and some modules go to a kernel default and some go to extra and some are to the optional. And some kind of default is uh, the supported modules. And kind of default extra contains the unsupported modules that are shipped for um, so the desktop and um, desktop extension, yeah. And kind of default optional, that is uh, uh, the one, the modules, also unsupported modules that are shipped only for OpenSUSE Leap. And meanwhile, kernel default base, that one, that is a different package, and 
This is a repackaged from the kernel default for only for the chosen modules. So it's not built on the, at the same time. And currently existing both kernel default and kernel default base packages, that confuse um, sometimes. And um, the people or system believe that kernel default base should be enough and just take that and report us that it's broken. <clears throat> and in the past, on the other hand, kernel default base was also a split package. So that means we had, uh, uh, we would have so four different kernel rings. So kernel default base is really core and kernel default, kernel default is on top of that, plus uh, so the supported modules and kernel default extra and kernel default optional. Uh, but uh, in that was a three. Uh, 11 time, and we changed their policy to um, kind of default base to be independent and later, because um, that's also brought confusion. And for um, usual use cases, you, you would have to two kind of packages. So you have to install two kind of packages, that is, well, somehow redundant or cumbersome. So that's why the reason that we have only one kind of default and the rest somehow switch. But we don't, right now we don't know which one is better. So this is a, one of the things to be discussed. And also the init RD rebuilds triggering. That has been a pain for a long time. And actually, the initRD is called once in kernel default package install and kernel default extra. And optionally, are postponed for the post, uh, post trans phase or somehow. Yeah. Takashi, can you maybe remind me why do we have kernel default base these days? Like, yeah. Question two. That's um, okay. What is it next? Yeah, uh, okay, not, not here, but uh, it's, it's required for the um, smaller system, like virtual machine and is that really J was. The, is that really the case still? Because e originally that was, the, well, that was the use case which we had once where we tried to make a really small VM image yeah. and even include certain modules or basically compile in certain modules in there. So that required us to have different things. But right. at the end, um, but so, uh, so yeah. the actual size difference is not that large, if I remember correctly, between... It, it, uh, it, it is, is. it right. is, yes. Well, let, let some expert. Well, the size difference between kernel default base and kernel default is not necessarily that, that large. But overall, I think, so from my perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, the question is, well, I, I think this is actually not enough. I think mm -hmm. we should we need to got, go much smaller because currently if if you look around there are many distributions out there that advertise 200 megabyte or fewer image sizes right for the edge we can't produce a 200 megabyte image if our kernel is already 250 megabyte that's that's just not possible right so if an edge is a big focus so if we want to get there we got to figure out how to get rid of well, not necessarily rid of, but split up the build such that many modules are KMPs, They're KMP packages, and then create mm -hmm. kernel default may just be a, make, a meta package that pulls in everything that we want on a server, right? And and yep. and we should, I, from my perspective, I think we should think in that direction and say, how can we <laughs> make more packages smaller and then make it easier composable? Yeah, thank you. That this comes in the next slide. It's now shown right now. So um, the more general question, so exactly, how should we split kernel packages? So or how we prepare the pa kernels for the smaller size? Yeah, Michael? Uh, uh, that uh, you can change uh, what uh, modules are, are included in kernel default base and rename it so that it uh, isn't confusing and <clears throat> rebuild it with whatever packages you want, uh, whatever modules you want. 
Like if you don't know, if you don't want IPv6 networking, well, that's probably built in for reasons. <laughs> but if you don't know, don't want uh, uh, some uh, some uh, uh, some protocol that uh, modular you can just exclude it, not have it in your base kernel package. Yeah, no, so the different scenarios have different re requirements. So the kernel default base is not always op optimal for any for the use cases, even for the smaller systems. Um, so ideally speaking, we can switch kernel uh, so pack, one package per kernel module. <laughs> That's a, uh, the Martin experimented that. Oh yeah, he stand up. Uh, one one thing I if I see here the the different conflicting packages. So my, my thinking is when you have, for example, kernel default VM, and you then need just one more module, it means that you have to throw away that kernel and, and install the full package instead. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, mm -hmm. What is there on the slide about my experience? That's correct. So the the Packaging every module individually is, of course, um, yeah, kind of crazy. But um, it was the idea was just to have that as a starting point, and then once we have, once that would be uh, uh, implemented, we could again group uh, yeah. some some modules that obviously belong together. For example, file system modules like. JBD and X, X2, X3, whatever, or, or others. Um, uh, there are lots of possibilities. The, the, the good thing about is that the, the kernel ABI and uh, KMP technology that we have enables us to track the dependencies between the modules. And so the person, for example, that would have kernel default VM and just needs one more driver couldn't. Uh, he, she could install that driver, and um, dependent modules would automatically pulled in, be pulled in. Um, that that would be a big advantage. On the other hand, we have had this discussion yesterday about uh, QEMU and and the uh, very complicated mm -hmm. user interface, and that's of of course something that one might to yeah one needs to solve. We need a good user interface for that. Otherwise, it's nonsense. The, the other thing is that if you need just one extra module in kernel default VM, you can uh, change the kernel default VM spec file at the module name there and rebuild it. It takes about two minutes to build because it doesn't build the kernel, it just pulls the kernel default uh, and uh, extracts the packages, uh, the, extracts the modules and uh, re rebuilds it uh, as a new package. Right. It's just the selected modules. Yes, and so th this can be seen as a kind of the kernel, so the minimum kernel default plus, and some repackage things so that you can pick up any modules. So you have uh, some combination of modules as you like. And that means that we can create a bunch of different flavors with a bunch of extra stuff just for one specific scene or so. so I had a quick question for Martin. Uh, in your experiments, did you do any experimentation with the update? When you have like one module per package, how did the update go? <laughs> so um, I, I like the idea of having a bunch of small kernel packages for different use cases like that. Not to this level. I think we can do more granular than that. But as I, as I recall, every time that we've tried to do broken up kernel packages, the two biggest problems we run into are the initRD getting generated properly at the right time with everything that needs to be in it, and how to keep updates consistent. Did you do any experimenting with updates when you were working with it? Because I mean, getting it to install is the easy part. It's the, the updating it consistently is the hard part. Well, I have to think that's true, sorry. Uh, 
Yeah, I think that's a problem because um, if the module gets renamed per version update, then we cannot trap that well. Um, and can be, as a kind of pack, package, each module can provide the hardware capability. I mean, so PCI ID and so on. So metadata can be trapped, but it doesn't mean that it handles, uh, for example, package renames. Or so. so it could be a problem by up, update, yes. Um, also, the, um, another thing that here, um, the split kind of module is um, that, for example, if we plug the hot plug device with the unknown file system, how we can handle that? That's, it's not clear yet. For example, if, if we put the X, X patch, yeah, USB stick, and but you have no module there, and ideally speaking, the system should pick up the X patch kernel module there automatically and oh. install that and that. Well, I'm not sure we need to be that general, right? If if you look at the various use cases that we try to cover, right? We have the general server and or desktop that we all have, and yes, we all want yeah. to stick the USB stick in and it work. And for that, we have kernel default, and yeah. however that may be composed, right? But for the other use cases, like on the edge, the people that we deal with, they know their hardware, mm -hmm. and, and they know what kind of USB stick they stick in there. So, yeah. you know, I'm thinking when we provide these images to those specific customers where we have direct relationships, we can give them a kernel that is more customized, still from mm. the stock kernel that the labs team maintains, but it meets their use case, right? And that, that would make us more competitive compared to the other guys. And the regular, the regular use cases, what we all use on our laptops and desktops and what goes in the server, doesn't really change all that much from there, right? And, um, and maybe an intermediate step is not have a, you know, one KMP per module, but one per subsystem, so there would be USB and and whatever telephony and sound KMPs and whatever, instead of having one per module. Right? Well, the, if um, we have some certain customers that we want to provide some very specific kind of set package set, then it's actually doable even right now, just uh, the same way as we. Would Build the kernel default base. It's, it's a just repackaging of the certain set of modules. So it's and it's it's, it's doable, but uh, it doesn't scale much. So if we have 100, 200 different that sets of the combinations, then it's um, it's basically the manual choice of the modules, and that can become the problem. So uh, yeah. So I think the I think the argument that Robert's trying to make is that we're not giving customers with these custom use cases the tools they need. So right now, the only way to do it is to take kernel default, install it, use Kiwi or something to strip out the things you don't want, and end up with something that doesn't resemble what we ship anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're right that, that trying to do this on a per-customer case with repackaging doesn't scale at all. And usually that's something that we would end up having to charge for because it is extra work for us. And that makes us not competitive in that space anymore. But I think that, one more thing. <clears throat> and I, I kind of like the idea of having it per subsystem, but I think what we need to do is probably recognize what common device profiles there are. And so we can have, you know, we, a, a file system subsystem might not make any sense because most, most use cases are only going to use two or three of them. Um, mm -hmm. Likewise with USB devices, like I have my uh, KVM small kernel config mm -hmm. because all, it builds the entire USB stack with every single device and I never need any of them. But if I want to boot a VM, I need like HID. And if we can figure out what the common ones are going to be in those subsystems and, and package those one way and then everything else is like, you know, if you need the kitchen sink, then pull this in. I think that would be a, a good compromise so that you can still have the, the flexibility of being able to pull in just the bits you want but also not ending up with 4,000 packages. I mean, even, in, even internally, right? So I'll give an example. We, for, we, we build a specific image for SAP uh, mm -hmm. that they run inside of RISE, which is SAP's cloud offering, right? 
And uh, for many, many years, they say, yeah, your image is too big, right? And, and yes, in the cloud, size doesn't matter, right? Because our root volume is 10 gigabytes. And whether I put a gigabyte on there of stuff or five gigabytes, they all start up at the same time. It really doesn't matter. But SAP looks at this from, okay, then you have more stuff, you have a higher profile of exposure, right, and whatever. And, you know, it's a fair argument. And, and do you really want to argue about that? But when, when we want to build that image, let's say for AWS, hmm. I can't really, you know, I can write a script in, in the image building that gets rid of a bunch of modules, which actually makes the image smaller, right? But it is not convenient. Plus the stuff in the kernel changes, right? So every time the kernel changes, I have to go look at my script and say, okay, is there more stuff that I can remove and, and things like that, right? And so if there's something that the kernel team can provide to make the life, you know, even internally easier, that would be great. Hmm. Yep. Exactly for this purpose, we have the uh, repackaging that uh, builds kernel default base that you can build a uh, kernel with your own list of modules and people don't use it. And yes, there is the need to manually select which modules you want. But we can't alleviate that problem. You have to know what you want. Yeah, I don't, but I don't want to build. I want to pick. I want to pick what's finished, what, what is <laughs> built by the kernel team. I don't want to go and set up configs and whatever else. That, that is not what I do. But it's not built uh, as a kernel. It's built as a uh, as a RPM package. Yeah, just just repackaging. Yeah, it's, it's it, the time is really quick. So the, yeah. takes the kernel default base that we provide and picks the modules that you want. You there is a list of modules that is encoded and anything else goes away. I think the the problem with that is that what ends up happening is that it's technically correct. It does offer the solution technically but it's not what any users want. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to do that process, and that's why nobody's adopting it. What users do want is what Robert's saying, the ability to just pick and choose what they want from a list without having to do anything other than install it. Or even automatically scan for the system for at least uh, the common uh, USB IDs, PCI IDs, the way you uh, where the, you have these uh, drivers, you don't want to have, as you said, uh, you don't want to have these huge amounts of uh, drivers. You have specifics, but you don't want to choose, even choose them. You want the system to uh, detect, oh, there's a new device. I don't have this I, uh, driver here, but it is available somewhere. Pick it, g get it, and load it. Yeah, and uh, pardon, and, and you can, um, it is working for NVIDIA f f f with a certain hacks. It is working for other things already by the hardware IDs. Um, you mentioned it already, um, but this can be extended to file systems like IDs uh, um, and so on. So uh, if you want a certain file system, this module is, can be, be available. <laughs> I think we're halfway there with that, because I think the ability to say, uh, I want a module that provides the driver for this PCI ID, this, the, the driver for this USB ID would be probably helpful for our partners as well to say, not, not <clears throat> I'm, I'm gonna get to the, the other part of that in a second, but the ability to say, I need a driver that does this, rather than say, I need to know exactly what the, the package name for this driver is. I think there's value there. But the, the, the other part of it that we need to solve is that when we're talking about deploying systems in the cloud, when we're talking about deploying systems on the edge, there's no installer involved at all. Mm -hmm. So this is gonna be the, the definition of the system is predefined and mm -hmm. all those packages are defined and then deployed as a whole. And so having it detected on the live system isn't what the customer wants either because then you have to have that repository available to pull from and the idea is that this should be self-contained. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just to reiterate what Jeff said, the idea of go get it, that, that doesn't necessarily work, right? I mean, just in the cloud where we wouldn't really have that because we know what we're running on, 
but the idea of go get it, you know, there's probably an instance that's not registered to any repository. And then what, you know, if we have some mechanism that says go get it, where would it get it from? There's no repository, right? So. But if the selection process is uh, neat enough or s small enough, it maybe can be made um, use of to reduce the size of the cloud images as well. Yeah, some, some kind of an old configuration yeah, tool that might be helpful, yeah, as a sort of start. Couldn't we provide as part of the kernel, uh, kernel default image a tool that would just save the modules that we don't need and save, like have a list of modules that we want to keep and run this automatically after in a post-install script of the kernel default uh, RPM. So we could just strip out the modules that we don't need after each update automatically. Like, uh, like we would install kernel default, but we would not keep all the files. Yeah, that, that's, that's possible. But uh, as I said, that it's the question is how to detect the, the features that you would need in future. Well, we could easily see what modules are loaded first, and then pick those, and then you can manually add the few for <laughs> the mobile devices or something. Yeah. Um, the, prob the, prob the problem with that ends up being, especially in the cloud, right? Yeah. Uh, users can easily move your, their instance types. And so if I build the kernel, if I strip out stuff I don't need on one instance type, and then they stop the, they stop the instance and move it to a different instance type and need a, a different driver, where they're going to get it from, right? So the, the total machine customization also does not, well, it holds big pitfalls, let me put it that way. Okay, um, okay there is one more. Oh, wait. Yeah, uh, yeah, one idea. At, at least what would work for us in, or could work for us in, in automotive or edge scenarios, why don't you split the kernel into like modules? Like there are different RPM packages for everything if you want put in RPM packages, but everyone knows that there is patterns for everything. There's patterns desktop, there's patterns, I don't know, KVM. Why don't you make a patterns kernel desktop, a patterns kernel VM, kernel cloud or whatever, and then you don't strip everything and, I don't know, find some way to probe the system, but you still keep delivering a kernel default for desktop, but the kernel is, is split, but there's a pattern kernel default and something like that. So we could create a pattern kernel kind of automotive, and if a customer wants something very minimal, they can create their patterns mm -hmm. or something like that. So the way that we've handled that traditionally is with meta packages. So if you look yes. at, if, so not, not patterns, but RPMs that just have dependencies that are pulled in. So if, you, if you've ever built kernel modules, uh, like a KMP that needs to be built across a few different flavors, you've probably seen the kernel sims package. And the kernel sims package may have a readme, but otherwise it, all it does is pull in other packages. And so if you wanted to have like a kernel automotive, that would probably be the easiest way to do it. And you wouldn't even need to necessarily build it out of the kernel package. It could be your own thing, though the keeping the version numbers synced up makes sense to put it in the, the kernel package itself. Yeah. And there is another problem uh, for us that you have listed there, Carvos. Uh, there is the thing that not everything is modular and mm -hmm. we have some different things like that you could change parameters that you would need to build a different kernel because it's, it's not something that can mm -hmm. fit in a model and is there a plan for some modularity in that scenario like to build different kind of flavors with some things enabled and other things disabled well, this is not decided at all, and there is no <laughs> concrete plan at all. Or yeah, is there? Okay. <laughs> so it, it's to be discussed, and yeah, it's a good input. So we have different configurations, and so completely different output, so outcomes depending on the kind of flavors, right? Okay, um, just a timing, timing up, wait a minute, then us, just quickly, then we have a problem, an externally supported flag, and this is, um, well, we have two kind of 
unsupported or externally supported flag. And, and so far, we are not sure whether it's really needed for ADP2, but maybe it's a question to the product management and so not technical. <laughs> answer that one because I yeah. added it. Um, it used the taint flag because that was what was around at the time, and this is old. And yep. it was an easy way to display in the oops message that something was off. And since then, we have extended what we do with it. So now there's a special sysfs file that you can see for every kernel module. You can see it for the kernel itself, whether or not each one is supported or if it's externally supported or whatever. And now it actually says supported equals yes, no, or yes, external in the oops. Mm. So I think we should keep this behavior, but I don't think it needs to use the taint flag to do it. Okay. That sounds reasonable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Disagreement. Not direct disagreement, but uh, one of the as of yet unresolved issues is that the software support versus hardware support we repeatedly came across customer issues which, well, called upon us for support on hardware which was long since mm -hmm. expired. Unfortunately, we never actually made it clear that the support we are giving is somehow tied to the hardware. And so if the hardware is out of support, chances are your software will be out of support too. So we are now in this unfortunate situation that we support the software, whereas the hardware is long out of support. And as we supply the drivers, we are actually obliged to fix the driver for which we won't be getting any hardware support from the vendors anymore, which is continues to uh, continue to uh, 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 um, having giving us problems. So I really right. would like to mm. either say right, okay, there is a hardware component involved, so you might check with your vendor, or um, indeed marking some old PCI device as, as out of support by the hardware vendor. <laughs> some expiration for that. <laughs> I can follow up on that one too. Um, I think one of the things we have there is, so for uh, ButterFS, the way that we rolled it out, if you're, you're not familiar, is that we released various parts of the feature set over time and marked the parts that we weren't ready to support as unsupported features. Now that means that we have a facility inside the kernel that we can dynamically turn that on and off. And so I think it would be possible for us to mark drivers or PCI IDs inside of drivers using the same sort of unsupported feature flag. And that would mean that you could return an error when you didn't want to support the device and the user could override it if they wanted to. But mm -hmm. it would also have the same impact where it would say, you're using unsupported features, your, your system's unsupported now. Maybe it should be clarified. I think that, um, that what's really the supported flag and external support status means, yeah, I think. Anyway, the last slide here is just a um, bunch of the so unresolved stuff. So size reduction, um, so, as I said, kind of config reduction, we are working on that, but we still don't know how so intensively we should cut down, cut off. Also, the, RPM change log is uh, yeah, getting very huge volume, and I, we don't know whether we should keep that or not. Um, because if we split the pack, you know, we have, we have more, more and more packages, then it, each package contains yeah, gigabyte of change log or whatever. <laughs> um, kind of ABI compatibility stuff, um, I guess we will keep the three uh, style. But uh, this can be, of course, improved if technically possible, and we have some time. Also, multi-version installation of the multi-version kernel package on the this, on this one system. I think that Misha worked on that for some Jira tickets. I don't know exactly the current status, but uh, I hope that that situation will be improved. And uh, recently, we are asked to switch from the linked package to the multi-build um, builds uh, for the ARP because all of the, uh, also the Git workflow and so on, that should be discussed later. And yeah, that's a Tony's uh, session about user space packages, how, how we can yeah, um, so build better, or un unify better uh, the user space um, package like uh, for tools or Linux, JVC, JVC Debel, so header package from the kernel source. That's still unresolved, and 
and my time is up now. So thank you.